Hello, and welcome to Discovering True Health, your weekly deep dive into health and wellness. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we get started with today's show, please hit that subscribe button. It helps us out a lot, and you'll stay up to date on all our upcoming shows. You can also check out additional information on our website, Instagram, and Facebook. All those links are below. Now, research shows that heart disease is the leading cause of death in the U.S. with cancer coming in at number two. In fact, one person dies every 32 seconds in the United States from cardiovascular disease. And over the last 30 years, deaths and disabilities from cardiovascular disease have been steadily rising across the globe. Now, heart disease is also very big business in the U.S. healthcare industry and brings in a whopping $229 billion each year based on 2017-2018 statistics. Now, research also shows that 90% of the nearly 18 million heart disease cases worldwide could be prevented by people adopting a healthier diet, doing regular exercise, and not smoking. So today on Discovering True Health, we will be learning how we can take back control of our own health and be part of that 90% group. We'll be learning what to eat and what to eliminate in our diets to mitigate and prevent chronic illness like cardiovascular disease and cancer. And we'll also be learning a bit of the history of the health healthcare business and the pharmaceutical industry and how we got to the point we are at today with skyrocketing chronic illness numbers. My guests will also be sharing solutions and strategies for achieving optimal health and longevity. So my guest today is Michael Dorfman. He's a speaker, educator, and author of The Thriving Vegan, How to Discover the Foods Your Body Loves. And Michael turned his health around when he decided to become a whole food plant-based vegan. So thank you so much for joining me today, Michael. Well, thank you very much, Christy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I think it's going to be a nice, exciting hour. Now, I'd love to hear with our start with hearing a little bit about your background and story. Why did you change to a whole food, plant-based vegan diet? What were the results you saw after the change, and what were some of the things around diet nutrition you learned along the way through your own journey? Okay, well, I'd like to go back to, uh, I was, uh, well, I was born in uh, 1942. Uh, so this year I celebrated my 80th birthday. And, and uh, I was born into a family, uh, it was during the war. It actually was one month after uh, the Japanese invaded Pearl Harbor that I was born. And my father, because he had two children, he, uh, he was, he didn't have to go to you know, he didn't have to fight. So they put him uh, during the war on painting uh, ships. Uh, he, in fact, he painted the, the Queen Mary. So anyway, uh, after the war, my father became a butcher. And uh, because of that, uh, my, my diet at that time and many years after that uh, was going to be based on meat and dairy. And we, used, we had meat every single day. Uh, but it wasn't only my father, my, my un two uncles were butchers, and eventually my brother grew up. Uh, he became a butcher, so there was a lot of uh, butchers in the family, and we ate all kinds of meat. We ate uh, uh, the organ meat, we, ate, we even ate brains. My mother used to make a uh, salad out of brains, so that's the way I grew up, and uh, I didn't question it. It, it, it. At that age, you just eat what your mother puts on the table. That was uh, that was our diet. So this continued. I went to school. I I, I did two years postgraduate work in uh, in psychology, and then uh, I decided to move to Mexico. I made a trip to Mexico. Actually, it was on motorcycle, and uh, and here I've been. It's been uh, more than forty years that I've been living in Mexico. I met my wife here, and I have two children who are also uh, uh, were born in Mexico. So. In 1976, uh, I, I became very interested in Eastern philosophies and religions. And uh, I felt, well, I, I saw that on that side of the world, there were a lot of vegetarians. So I, I decided to become a vegetarian. That was 1976. 
And that continued for about 33 years. I, I didn't eat any meat, although I ate a, sort of dairy was sort of the substitute for meat. So I ate a lot of dairy, uh, mostly cheeses and yogurts and whatever it was that was dairy. I, I just love dairy and especially the pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I did that and I, I felt pretty good. But every year I would get sick at least once a year. It wasn't a, any serious illness. It was, you know, flu like symptoms. I would have congestion and sore throat and uh, uh, cough and fever, and it, it never failed. It was either once or twice a year. And also, I at that time I had uh, I used to get arrhythmias, which was you know I, my my heartbeat would not only skip, sometimes it would go into a murmur. And uh, I went to the I had it checked out several times, but they told me that it was OK. It was no big deal. But to me, I, it was uh, scary. You know, sometimes it, it went on for weeks. So anyway, I, I did that and uh, that went on while I was a vegetarian. My brother, who at that time he was older than me, actually, he's uh, now 86 years old. He was uh, he had be, uh, been following a plant based diet for about 20 years at that time. And he told me, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, the reason that you still be having these problems is because you're eating dairy. And he suggested, well, why don't you try uh, a whole food plant based diet? And to me, it was at that time is it was really difficult to make the change. And I understand also that for many people, uh, it's more difficult giving up dairy than it is even giving up meat. So I didn't do that. But then he suggested, why don't you read this book? It's called The China Study, which is written by T. Colin Campbell, Dr. Campbell. And it was it became a, a major uh, seller uh, on Amazon and the New York Times. And I read the book and it just really had an impact on me. Uh, just uh, seeing what was happening on the other side of the world. He had been commissioned to do study on cancer in China for a 20-year study. And uh, I read the book, and uh, I decided to make the change. And that was 14 years ago. So this is the way it's been for the past 14 years. Uh, I, those problems I had every single year, they're gone. And now uh, they're, uh, my uh, arrhythmias are gone. And other things as well. I just become, I just feel I'm becoming more and more healthy as, you know, time goes by. But, and that was for my own personal health. But what really made a big difference in my life uh, was we had a friend, my wife and I had a friend, her name was Beatrice, and she was born, well, she lived on the island of Cozumel, which is on the Caribbean, Mexico. And uh, this was about, uh, uh, let's see, it was like 10 years ago. She, uh, she had a heart attack and then she was taken to the to the to the hospital in Merida, which is uh, in the eastern side of Mexico. And she uh, had a surgery, had a, a, a quadruple bypass surgery. And the doctor sent her home. They said, well, OK, uh, that's it. You can go home. And uh, for one year, she felt OK. And at the end of the year, she uh, started having pain in her right arm. The doctors called her back and they decided that they wanted to put a, wanted to put a stent uh, in because of her artery that the artery that, well, it was the vein that replaced the original artery uh, was uh, blocked. So they wanted to put a stent in. The problem was the stent didn't fit and because her vein was very narrow. So the doctors, they just told her there's nothing we really can do. You're going to have to go home and just, uh, you know, make sure you don't uh, do too much exercise or you get stressed out and uh, don't climb too many stairs, even though her bedroom was on the second floor. So what they didn't tell her and they told my wife and they also told her son was that she had approximately six months to live. So and she and when I heard about this. Uh, I had already been about, it was about two years or three years that I had already been uh, on a, a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, I was, 
I didn't I wanted to talk to her about this because I had been reading about doctors that were having uh, a lot of success with uh, plant based foods to, to reverse uh, heart disease. And this especially it was uh, uh, Esselstein, uh, who was who wrote the how to uh, pre uh, prevent and reverse heart disease. Caldwell Essenstein was his uh, his full name. So he was a, uh, a surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic. The Cleveland Clinic is considered maybe the number one heart clinic and heart hospital in the United States and maybe even the world. So I, I uh, told her about this book and uh, I, I let her borrow it. And uh, she read it and uh, she decided to make the change. So she became a, uh, a vegan. So instead of six months, it, she lived for uh, nine years. And uh, to me, it, it had a tremendous impact because it was the first time I heard about, you know, uh, people being, you know, cured and, and heart disease being reversed. But it never occurred to me that it could actually help a friend of mine. So right. this is what happened. And uh, she uh, had, well, she lived for nine years. And uh, to me, it was, uh, I started thinking, well, well, how come this is not the default cure for heart disease like you were mentioning at the, you know at the beginning of the presentation i mean it just seems that at least you know suggest to your patients if you're a heart specialist well why don't you try dieting but that's not being done so this was a real wake up call to me and uh, then i thought well maybe you know if it's not if it's only you know if it's heart disease are there other uh, chronic diseases that could be helped through diet and even the lifestyle pra lifestyle practices. So to me, this was uh, the decision I, I made was I got to let other people know about this. I really so that's what I'm doing. I wrote the book in 2019 and uh, I'm doing these podcasts and I'm, I have my website. And so this is basically what I, my, I made my mission is to really inform people on uh, the power of uh, plant-based foods and healthy lifestyle practices. And thank you so much for doing that. It's so important that we learn from others like you who have experienced this. Not only you've experienced it, but you witnessed a friend experience it. So, you know, it's it's something that's really works and working and you've read the studies. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, the number one cause of death is heart disease and cancer is coming in at number two. And research shows it's 90% preventable with, and diet is one of the risk factors. And yet, like you mentioned, doctors aren't really having these kind of in-depth. It's more of a kind of medical-based um, or pharmaceutical-based kind of, you know, uh, diagnosis. And, um, you know, this is, this is how we're going to help you kind of thing. So what are the foods... Um, that we should avoid and foods to add into our diets to reduce our chances of heart disease and prevent cancer. It sounds like going vegan is one thing, but also what does whole food plant-based mean for those that don't understand, you know, what, you know, what that means? How does that kind of break down in terms of what they should be eating? And is it ever too late to turn around our health if we're kind of further down the road with one of these chronic illnesses? Right. Well, I think, first of all, it really uh, should be clear that you can be eating vegan foods and not be eating healthy foods. So you can, for example, eat, uh, well, fried potatoes, potato chips, uh, cakes and cookies, donuts. And there's a lot of things you can eat. A lot of processed foods are, uh, you know, may not have uh, animal products in it. So you can be eating that. And I think a lot of pe uh, people who are claimed to be vegans are, you know, vegans because of uh, which is very important also, you know, animal cruelty and saving the planet. So but we're talking about whole food plant based, which is the only way to become healthy because you're eating healthy foods. So uh, basically, for me, uh, it's been, well, obviously, if it's plant based, you, you know, avoid meats, uh, dairy, eggs and highly processed uh, foods 
which is what you find when you go to the supermarket. That's what's in all the middle sections of the of the uh, of the supermarket are the processed foods. So it's really important to, if you're going to eat a processed foods because I eat. You know, once you start cooking or doing anything to food, it becomes processed. But the question is, well, what? How far is the process going? So it's important to read the ingredients, for example, and see how many lines you're reading and if do you understand what the ingredients are because sometimes we don't because they have special names to them so you have to check whether it has the sugar if there's a lot of oils in the uh, in the ingredients the uh, additives preservatives uh it's just really important and the, even though a food may be processed you want it to be the least processed possible so as far as the meat you know what i had mentioned you want to avoid especially the processed meats and uh, meats in general because uh, the problem with the uh, meat, dairy, and eggs is that they're all calorie dense and they're not uh, very dense as far as nutrients are concerned. They also contain very high amounts of saturated fats, uh, cholesterol, and uh, if you're eating uh, 95 percent of the people who eat uh, meat and consume dairy and eggs are uh, getting this from the factory farms. And once you get into the factory farms, which is almost, you know, we're eating uh, millions of uh, animals a day uh, in, the, in the United States. So once you start, uh, you know, eating the meat and the dairy and the eggs, you're getting, as I mentioned, the cholesterol. Also, you're getting the inflammatory hormones and antibiotics. Why? Because the animals that are in the factory farms are given the hormones so that they grow. And that's what the whole idea is, because the bottom line is, you know, the profit. And then the antibiotics, which are given to the animals, in order to prevent them from getting, uh, you know, infections, because uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that parts of any uh, documentaries, how the animals are just stuck together in very small environment, you know, very close to each other, and they could spread the diseases. So they're given enormous amount of antibiotics. In fact, 85% of all the antibiotics that are produced in the United States are given to animals in order so they don't get sick. So when you eat these animals, uh, you're getting uh, the hormones and the anti-antibiotics, which is not very healthy. And as far as the, uh, the plant-based, plant foods are nutrient-dense. They're also low in calories. So in fact, in my opinion, and I've seen it in myself as well, the best way of losing weight, you don't have to go on a diet. You just have to eat plant-based foods because they're so uh, low on calories and high in, in nutrition. And over a long period of time, you're just able to keep the weight off because you're not going on a diet for a few weeks and then you end up going back to what you were eating before, which happens most of the time. So it includes, you know, eating lots of vegetables, uh, legumes, you know, the beans, uh, chickpeas and peas. And uh, uh, what else is there? There's uh, uh, kale. And then you have the uh, leg, uh, the, the uh, cruciferous, which are the, uh, the broccoli and the uh, uh, cauliflower and different thing, and then you have the grains and the, and the bee and the uh, the seeds and the nuts. Uh, uh, very important, the green leafy vegetables. What's very important about eating uh, a variety of uh, vegetables is important because of the colors. The colors, eating different colors, uh, the colors are represented, represent the antioxidants. So each color, each different vegetable has a different color. They have different antioxidants, which is great against fighting against cancer, wow. against the free radicals. And they also have the phytonutrients, which the plants have, which they use to protect themselves from uh, the environment, from plagues, from insects, uh, etc., and also plant-based foods uh, don't have uh, cholesterol, except for there's some cholesterol in, 
in coconut and uh, uh, what is the uh, palm palm oil, uh, palm trees. Uh, they have some cholesterol in it. So you're getting uh, you're just getting uh, good foods. And also, what's very important is you're getting the fiber. We need fiber, and fiber only comes from plants. Fiber is the plants what bones are to human beings. It keeps the plants up. For, it keeps them growing upwards. So fiber is the is the favorite food of our microbiome, which I you know we're starting to learn a lot about. Got it. Thanks for sharing that. And do you think that you know we talk a lot about how nothing's a one size fits all? Do you think there are certain people? that meat is good for and certain people that should not eat meat some people should eat a minimal amount of meat or do you think across the board for for us it's i mean obviously the reasons you know there are other reasons besides health yeah. and the reasons besides the quality of meat too that's the main issue but do, do you think some bodies need more meat and some bodies don't that's a good question and i'm not a hundred percent uh convinced on the on the answer I look towards the, uh, for example, the healthiest uh, people on the planet are uh, are the ones who live in the uh, uh, the rural areas of China, Japan, and Africa, as well as the uh, the blue zones. The blue zones are certain areas. There are five blue zones in the, around the world where they're uh, they're the longest living people, and they do. They do eat some meat. Most of these places do eat some meat, some fish, but it's it's a more like a garnish. They don't make it the center of their food. Right. So if you know if you're going to eat meat, uh, uh, ma you make it uh, minimal, and it's hard, you know, especially. And I understand that it's it's hard for people. So, you know, I gave up uh, when I gave up uh, meat and became a vegetarian, I gave up immediately. It was one day to the next. I wasn't eating meat. I, I gave up smoking the next the same day. I gave up meat Wow! and I had smoking for years. So I'm, that's my personality or whatever you, you can call it. But not everybody is like that. A, a lot of people have to take it slowly. And uh you know, even if you take it slowly, if, if you're usually eating meat every day, you know, cut it down to uh, three times a week, you know, put in it's it's amazing the amount of of uh, recipes there are now about plant based food, plant based dishes. It's there's infinitely more recipes on plant based uh, uh, foods on making meals than there are in making uh, using meat for meals. Mm -hmm. It's just growing. There's thousands of them. Yes. You know, so you can say uh, instead of eating meat, you can, uh, you know, put in tofu or there's so many different ways. My wife is an incredible uh, cook, uh, plant based cook. She's been doing it for the amount of years we've been here plant based. So she's an expert. But there's so many uh, recipes out there that there really shouldn't be a. Uh, a difficult time uh, for people to make a change. Plus, there's you know there's more and more products on the market. You know, uh, uh, even though to me it's maybe not the perfect food. They have these uh, the hamburgers and different uh, you know meats uh, that uh, you know McDonald's puts out. They're all plant based. You know, maybe they're not perfect, but it, they're good stepping stones. But to me, it's trying to get as close as you can to whole food plant-based in order to really uh, appreciate the uh, the benefits. And what are some of the, um, I guess, ways, if you decide to go full vegan, what are some of the ways you get your protein from? Well, that's, uh, where do you get your protein from? That's the big question. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when somebody asks me where I get the protein from, and uh, I'll just, well, my fr my first answer would be, uh, well, I get my protein from the pla same place that uh, a gorilla gets his protein, a cow gets his protein, uh, an elephant gets his protein, a water <laughs> buffalo gets his protein, a rhinoceros gets his protein. 
Even the Brontosaurus from the prehistoric time, they ate leaves off of trees. Right. So, and the fact of the matter is, it all comes from plants. I mean, you eat the cow. Where does the cow get the protein? Cow gets the protein from the grass. Well, not anymore because they're being fed uh, foods that they're not supposed to be fed uh, on the, you know, in, in the uh, farm, the factory farms. But initially, that's where they get it. So everything, all of the vitamins and the minerals originally come from from the the plants so for me uh where why shouldn't i try to get it from the same place and the proteins come, that's where they get their proteins from and uh you get plenty of proteins from plant plants and then my second question my second answer is i start you know make uh naming some of the uh you know vegan athletes there are a lot of vegan athletes that are are plant-based now and uh, they're saying that they're they've been performing better than they ever have. Wow! In, in different sports, I mean, we have uh, Tom Brady is about ninety percent uh, vegan. They had the Williams sisters, Venus Williams and Serena Williams, uh, Kyrie Irving from basketball. Uh, the uh, uh, the Tennessee Titans have the thirteen uh, vegan players on their squad. So it's. Uh, and all the so many actors and actresses are, be, are now becoming becoming vegans. There's a great video uh, called "The Game Changers." Uh, I don't know if uh, you know your you know your listeners have heard of it. It's on actually. It's on uh, Netflix, "The Game Changers," and it was uh, produced by James Cameron, the guy, uh, the director of uh, of uh, the Titanic. So uh, it came out uh, about three years ago. And it go, it's a wonderful video. It really shows uh, how, you know, the athletes it has so many athletes on there that have turned into vegans. And uh, it just, you know, they show the testing, the differences. It's a great uh, documentary. It's called The Game Changers. So to me, it's uh, and the other thing that you get when the, you eat the, uh, you know, you eat the uh, plant based, you get the fiber which is, uh, to me, fiber is more important than the protein. We focus on protein. It's like protein, 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 protein. That's the most important thing you right. see. You know, so many people eating, the, you know, protein powders and everything they want to get. Through these, we go through these phase, like these fads in the food industry where they're like pumping and promoting a certain type of food. Exactly. And the, what we need to focus on more than protein is fiber. Because fiber is the favorite food of our microbiome, as I mentioned, and we're only getting a tiny fraction of what we need uh, uh, to be healthy. Right. And fiber, what, the, what happens when you eat the fiber, uh, the fi you know, a lot of people talk about the, uh, the prebiotics. You know, they take prebiotics because it's, it's healthy, you know, fermented foods. When you eat fiber, the fiber is the favorite food and the the uh, the microbi uh, the microorganisms bacteria they ferment the fiber uh, into short chain uh, short chain uh, fatty acids which strengthens uh, our immune system so that's what the, why we need the fiber we're not getting enough of it that's why we're uh, so many people are experiencing problems in their uh, digestive tract, like colon cancer and uh, uh, Crohn's disease. I have a friend who uh, who went through uh, ulcerated colitis, but then more and more because we're not eating healthy for our gut. Right. And that's why it's so important, the fiber. Wow. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's definitely a game changer. And the my gut microbiome is I mean, we need to learn so much more about it and really eat for that. Um, and I love this mindset shifts. You talked about how, you know, I mean, all these gigantic animals that are very muscular <laughs> are vegan. <laughs> I mean, that's a great way to be like, oh, yeah, you know what? You're right. <laughs> Gorilla. You know, I, I, now that you mentioned it, there is uh, Pat Baboumian is one of the strongest men on the planet. And he's uh, he eats plant based foods. So he tells the story of uh, one person who had asked him, how did you how do you get as strong as an ox? Mm -hmm. And his answer was, I just eat what an ox eats. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's so true. I mean, that's just such a mindset shift. Uh -huh. 
I love that. Now the supplement industry has exploded <laughs> over the last yeah. while. Um, when it comes to deciding to take supplements or not, what are some important factors to know about that? And what's your take on supplements versus getting our nutrients from whole foods? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I, it was about eight years ago until about eight years ago, I was taking 13 supplements every day. I used to travel up because my parents were living in uh, South Florida and I used to travel up there and there was this company, I, I'm not going to mention the name, uh, where I used to buy my supplements. I used to spend hundreds of dollars twice a year uh, with these supplements uh, and I used to get, they used to produce uh, this magazine uh, that I used to get, you know, as a member of their club. So every month I would get the magazine and the max magazine had some great articles on uh, disease. And they always said, well, this is what you need to, uh, this is the vitamins and minerals you need to deal with this, this disease. But I noticed that they never told you to eat any foods with the vitamins and the minerals. And, and three, day, three pages after I would read the article, I would turn the page, one, two, three, I get to the third page. And there was the, uh, they would be selling the vitamin and the mineral that would be, that they were saying you should take. So they didn't tell you to eat the food. They would take you to tell you to take the vitamins and the minerals. Mm. And that's what I would do. And then I realized it's that, wait a second, I, this is a big business for them. And they're getting my money for the big business. So I made the, I got to the point where I made the choice that uh, I was going to give it a chance to, uh, I was going to let go of the vitamins and the minerals and see what happens. So this was, uh, you know, several years, a few years ago. And uh, I'm not told, I, I want to make it clear. I'm not talking about supplement, verbal, herbal supplements, because I take some herbal supplements. I take uh, curcumin and uh, I take uh, this thing. It's called amla powder, which is the Indian I, uh, the gooseberry. And uh, I, so I do take different uh, herbal -based. supplements, plant-based, right. Yeah. But I'm talking about the vitamins and the minerals. And, uh, and I, I stopped doing that. And I haven't missed it at all. And then I started reading more and more about it. And... Uh, the vitamin, the problem with the supplements is that uh, people start taking it and they just take more and more of it and they're, they're in taking it instead of depending on, on the whole foods. There's a big difference. And it's really important to understand that human beings have been eating whole foods for over 300,000 years. And before that, their ancestors, the apes, I mean, they were eating whole foods for a couple of million years. And all of a sudden, decades ago, the vitamin mineral supplement industry comes into play. And here we are, we're changing and we're starting to take these when the whole history of our, our you know, of the body is, has been eat, it's eating whole foods. The body loves whole foods. That's what it's the billions of years of... Uh, you know, going through evolution is being, you know, able to eat whole foods. And that's what we should be eating. The other reason is that the vitamin and mineral supplement industry is not regulated. It, it, ever since the 90s, it was deregulated. So you really don't even know what you're getting because mm. there is no control. There's more control in the drug industry, in the pharmaceutical drug industry, than there is in the, in the vitamin and mineral industry. And it's become, uh, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So to me, uh, uh, it's, I can explain it very simply. When you eat an apple, there's, you eat an apple, the apple, apple is full of a whole bunch of vitamins and minerals. It's full of flavor. It's full of the right sugars. So when you eat an apple, you're getting a, what's the word? A symphony of nutrients together and the body is eating it and it's taking in exactly what it needs it's using what it needs for example if you eat an apple 
And let's say an apple at one time during the day, it needs uh, 1,000, let's say 1,000 units of vitamin A. If you eat another apple after that, it's not going it, to not going to require the same amount of vitamin A because it already has what it, it took what it needed. So the the body is just this this orchestra leader. Mm -hmm. It's just taking the food and digesting and using what it, it needs, and that's what it loves. Plus, you're getting the fiber. You know, when you eat, take a vitamin supplement, you just you're not getting all this other stuff that goes with it, and the fiber is taken out of it. So whole plant-based foods is the way to go. And maybe, you know, for example, I guess uh, most people, uh, a lot of people are aware that vitamin B12 is uh, is recommended for people who are on a whole, whole plant-based diet. And uh, that's what uh, I take and most people who are vegans take. So that's, uh, you know, that's what we do. So anyway, so that's uh, B12 is what I take beside uh you know eating the whole foods right and i love that that uh analogy with the apple because it's you know we really need to allow our body to be the incredible orchestrator that it is because um, mm -hmm. it knows what it needs i mean we're we can use our brain and be like well i'm gonna give my body this tons more vitamin c today but like you said it might not need that and we might just it might just not even use it so eating the whole foods it will take what it needs and you know, let go of the rest. Yeah, as long as you're eating the healthy foods. Uh, right. That's yeah. very important. Okay. And, uh, you know, and also if you, there is so, you, you go to one doctor and he says, take uh, 5,000 milligrams of this. Then you go to another doctor and say, well, you 2,000. So they, it's really, they really don't know that much about it, what you, what the body really needs. And like you're saying, it may need different amounts at different times. Right. Now, you have seen a lot of shifts and changes, you know, with our healthcare system and the food industry through your lifetime. In what ways do our healthcare system and our society as a whole need to shift in our approach to healthcare in order to live healthier and mitigate disease? And what would a kind of a better healthcare paradigm look like, in your opinion? Okay. Well, our healthcare system, well, first of all, uh, the United States and most Western countries are not very healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and we could see it as, you know, this year, supposedly, the, uh, the th we're losing three years off of our life expectancy is the first year. And last year, it was the first year that uh, children were getting having a l lower life expectancy than their parents. But this was a couple of years ago. So things aren't getting better. They're getting worse. Yeah. And I think we can see it, you know, like you were mentioning at the beginning with heart disease and everything. Look at children. You know, children, the type 2 diabetes, you never heard of type 2 diabetes among children. It was called adult onset diabetes. And then when they saw they uh, took, they saw it was happening in, in children, they changed it, you know, to type 2 di uh, diabetes. Wow. Of course, it includes children. And look at the obesity rates. The United States and Mexico, where I live, one and two, sometimes it's the U.S., sometimes it's Mexico, in, in obesity. It's, uh, you know, I would think two-thirds of the people are either, in the United States, are either overweight or obese. And, uh, you know, and now another thing that's really important is that people understand that, you know, heart disease can and cancer, for example, they don't happen one day, you know, overnight. Right. You know, people go and they have their, you know, women go to have the mammogram and uh, they say, oh, uh, I have I have cancer. No, 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 no. You had cancer for many decades, probably. But it just grew to a size that they could detect. My father, for example, my father, my father was uh, he worked. I, I mentioned at the beginning he was painting on the ships in the. Uh, during World War II, he was he was in the hull of the ships in the bottom, and uh, forty years later, uh, he got uh, mesothelioma, which is uh, cancer in the lining of the lungs, which comes from asbestos, mm. and he was exposed to asbestos when he used to uh, uh, paint, you know, the ships in the hull of the ships. It took forty years for him to, for, to get to the point where, and eventually, he he was you know he had gone.
uh, he, he was gone a year after they uh, detected it. So uh, it's very important that people understand that diseases start when you're very young. Uh, they, they detect, you know, heart disease starts when you're in your 20s. And uh, it, it just doesn't happen. So we really got to take care of ourselves. The problem with our healthcare system, even though we have the best trained doctors, we have world class hospitals, we have cutting edge technology, we're still among the sickest people in, in the world. United States, see, if you look at the list of the healthiest countries, we're not even in the top 30. So it's, uh, you know, something's wrong with the healthcare system. And to me, it's, uh, you know, it's because uh, why the focus is on pharmaceutical drugs, focus is on surgery, chemo, radiation. That's what they, their go-to uh, cures are. And uh, basically, they focus on treating the symptoms and not the causes. We, do, we have to th think about treating the cause. We have to help ourselves to be do so we don't get sick. Doctors don't learn about nutrition and lifestyle practices when they go to school. You know, when they go to medical school, uh, there's hardly any instruction on nutrition, maybe hours during eight years that they study. So in order for a doctor or a health practice, practitioner to learn about alternative, uh, you know, cures and, and alternative treatments, they have to do it on their own. They have to go for, you know, study on their own uh, because uh, that's what, and I think one of the reasons is, uh, you know, I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it is that, you know, drug companies are part of the, the training that doctors go through. It's, they learn from the very beginning that uh, drugs are probably the go-to treatment. And that's what happens when we go to a doctor. That's the first thing they offer us is uh, a drug to take care of the symptom. Right, absolutely. And I think it's important to understand history and things weren't always this way in our healthcare system. This is something that came about at some point in history um, to where they are currently and it's kind of evolved and evolved from there. Can you give us kind of a brief overview of what kind of that point in history was and talk a bit about the germ theory of disease versus the terrain theory of disease and, you know, kind of how we got to the this point in right. our mm -hmm. health system. Yeah, I really love to do that. Uh, well, drugs, the pharmaceutical drugs uh, haven't been around all that long. If you go back in time uh, to the uh, 19th century, uh, the end of the 19th century, uh, the, uh, what was being used uh, by uh, health practitioners was holistic method medicine, where they, the, uh, the, the doctors at that time were seeing, they, they considered the whole human being uh, as, to take care of the whole human being. So they used homeopathy, naturopathy, osteopathy, uh, ac acupuncture, Chinese medicine, and even indigenous uh, herbal medicines. So when you went to the doctor at that time, that's what they had. There were no drugs at that time. And that's what the, uh, the hospitals at that time, the clinics were at that time. That's what they taught uh, the people who went through the, you know, the medical training. So that's what was happening. And then at the end of the, uh, the, the century, uh, it, there were two famous uh, uh, biochemists. One was uh, Louis Pasteur. And the other one was Antoine Bechamp. And we all, uh, we've heard of Louis Pasteur, the pasteurization. And uh, he uh, also had, uh, he created the uh, uh, anthrax vaccine and the uh, rabies vaccine. Oh. So Pasteur wrote the book on germ theory. And uh, germ theory was that, you know, most uh, diseases are ca caused by germs. And we have to kill the germs. And Antoine Bachamp, who was uh, living at that time, he was actually uh, a friend of uh, Pasteur. He came up with the terrain theory of disease. And his theory was, if the terrain is clean and the terrain is, is uh, uh, free of, uh, of garbage, then uh, the, uh, there won't be any germs. And I'll give you an example of it. Uh, for example, if there's a garbage dump 
And uh, around the garbage dump, there's uh, all these flies going around. And uh, so you go to the garbage dump and you, you look and say, well, I, how do I get rid of the flies? So one way of getting rid of the flies is you take a uh, you know, can of Raid and you spray them. And the flies, well, they're dead. And then you go away and you come back a couple hours later. And what do you know? There's more flies. So you take the raid again and you kill the flies and uh, you could keep on doing that. But Cham says there's another way. And the other way is get rid of the garbage. And he was saying that as far as, you know, the terrain theory of disease is that if you're if you're healthy and you're clean inside, you'll be protected against the germs. So that was the two uh, conflicting theories. And uh, obviously, uh, I don't think many people have heard of uh, Antoine Bechamp. And Pasteur's germ theory is what uh, continued on. And that's what we still believe in, in today. So it ended up at the beginning of uh, the uh, uh, 21st century, uh, Rockefeller, uh, J John D. D. Rockefeller, he was the wealthiest man on the planet. He was, it was Standard Oil. You know, that's where he made most of his money. He was the richest man on the planet, and he's probably compared to the richest men today, he'd still be considered the richest man that ever lived. Yeah. So they found out that uh, you can create uh, 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 medicines, you can create drugs through uh, the use of uh, chemicals in the petroleum. And that's what, once he found that out, it became uh, an important th uh, thing for him. He just saw the potential in it. So uh, he got together with Andrew Carnegie, who was a steel magnate. And together, they just put all so much money into creating this tremendous uh, industry. But in order to uh, make this industry successful, they had to uh, uh, reduce the dependence on the holistic uh, therapies that were being done before. And that's what he did. He created these uh, universities and uh, where he uh, invested, both of them invested a lot of money, but the base, basis of the universities would be uh, pharmaceuticals. And then they also used whatever they could. We know about, uh, you know, uh, disinformation or defaming people. And that's what they did. So whoever was practicing the homeopathy, naturopathy, et cetera, they were uh, ridiculed and uh, eventually uh, put out of business. And so the, uh, the holistic medicine, which was then the medicine, then became the alternative medicine. So this eventually, well, became a multi-billion dollar business through uh, advertising. And, and that's what it is today. And we're so dependent upon it, too dependent upon it. We know that it's just, you know, dependency on drugs. We see it being advertised in, uh, on TV all the time. And uh, you, it's interesting that there's only two countries, uh, the last thing I know, the only two countries that are allowed to advertise drugs on TV, and it's the United States and New Zealand. Other countries, Mexico, that you don't see advertising drugs on TV. And that's what they do in the United States. So it's pushed and pushed and pushed. But you'll notice, I'm sure you notice, you see that they always talk about the side effects. And yes. <laughs> it's really almost to me, it's so funny that they say, oh, you could do this. You could, you can die from it. You can get this. You can, it's unbelievable. And, uh, but, you, but it's so successful because they're not allowing you to see the truth about what, uh, you know, nutrition and lifestyle practices can actually do for us. Right. Thank you for sharing that history. It's so important to understand, you know, history and where things came from originally. And it sounds like the two kind of happened around the same time. So this, the theory, um, you know, that kind of pushed the vaccines and using the rain spray, you know, in your analogy to kill the bugs, that happened kind of hand in hand with the, you know, creation of the pharmaceutical industry. And right. this is only like 120 years ago, it's been around. Yeah. That's fair. And we're so with, uh, you know, it's people are dying from the side effects and uh, overdoses. 
I mean, we're so dependent upon but upon drugs for everything, you know, now with the uh, against depression, antidepressant, everybody's taking it. it. It's terrible. Yeah. And you and in your work, you talk about it as the third third leading cause of death that's not spoken about. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's it's interesting because what I talk about in the book is about the it's the uh, it's medical practices, a you know, third leading cause of death, but it includes the medical practice, medical errors. And it also includes the drug over, overdose and side effects. And each one of them all together, there's over 400. And, this was in 2016. That's when, you know, I, what I got in the book, uh, 440,000 uh, uh, deaths from uh, uh, medical uh, errors and drugs. And now it's, it's, it's more than that. But after heart, heart disease and cancer, either one of them, either medical errors, which is, well, the medical profession is the doctors and the hospitals. You, get, you can get the wrong medications. You can get infections. You can get unnecessary surgeries, surgical mistakes. It happened. I have two. How many people? I don't know. I know two people recently went into the hospital and they came out with something else that they went in for. And they both were if they went in for two problems and they both ended up with infections, uh, infections and, you know, infections. Why are you getting infections in the hospital? Is it, mm-hmm. You know, it's this is the problem. And then you have so that's through the medical pressure, and then you have the problem with the drugs, with the drug side effects and the overdose. Now, the overdose, it isn't that you're taking, you know, 50 pills at once, but much of the time, you know, a doctor says, okay, you could take this antibiotic uh, for five days and that'll be it, or this other drug for five days. But people don't stop at that. You take a pain reliever and the doctor, you shouldn't take it for more than five days. And it ends up that you take it for weeks and months. And yes. that's overdosing. And that's not, uh, you know, not healthy. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, when antibiotics, uh, I'm not saying uh, they never work. In fact, I had an experience where an antibiotic saved my life. I had in 1970, I had tuberculosis. Wow. And uh, I was diagnosed with tuberculosis. And I went to a doctor gave me a streptomycin which uh, my wife had inject me uh, every day for a month and I was cured. And that was the antibiotic at that time. Now, if you get to uh, tuberculosis, it's almost like chemotherapy because they're, the bugs are already, uh, you know, immune to uh, streptomycin would never work now. Right. So because people take all these drugs, you know, it just, it caused these uh, super bugs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we talk about the gut microbiome and, you know, that is basically the hub that runs your entire body. Your immune system lives there, your serotonin, your brain health, gut brain connection. I mean, it is vital for us. What are some of the ways that pharmaceuticals um, affect our gut microbiome that we should be aware of? Yeah. Well, uh, it's interesting because the gut microbiome is, uh, is a new field basically uh, it was it was well, discovered in, in Western medicine. <laughs> in, yeah, exactly. In, in Ayurveda medicine. and in, in yeah, or even, exactly, or even uh, you know, going back to the time of Hippocrates, he talked about all diseases start in the gut. Right. So, yeah, but the the gut is now seen as a new organ, and there's more studies now in the on the gut microbiome than any other subject in health. There are I think ten thousand studies and research papers done every year. And the reason why it's happening is because of the electron microscope. As in the, I think it was 2007, they reached to a point, reached the point where the electron microscope can already see these, you know, go deep into the, into the, you know, seeing these uh, microscopic uh, beings, you know, that actually there are more microbe cells in, uh, in, in than human cells in the human body, you know. So we're more microbes than we are human cells, and uh, so. But uh, what happens is that they they feed on the fiber. They feed on the fiber, and they uh, they're happy with it. But what happens is that it's not only what we eat. 
but there's other things that affect our, our gut, the microbiome in our gut. And this is caused by antibiotics, like I mentioned. It just destroys the, the microbiome. Also, the uh, chemical chemo drugs and other chemical drugs, other things such as uh, food additives and preservatives, uh, environmental toxins, pesticides and herbicides, when we the food we eat, that's another problem, you know, because they're getting sprayed with the glyphosate and then we eat that stuff. And that also affects the, the microbiome. And then you have the, the stress hormone with, you know, more and more we're under stress. So uh, we get the, you know, stress hormones that also, uh, you know, uh, uh, harms the microbiome. Eventually, it turns into a leaky gut, yeah. you know, where the toxins leak into the bloodstream, the toxins, because what happens with the leaky, I, I thought I just mentioned this, with the leaky gut, the, 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 we have our digestive system, especially 70% of the uh, microbiome is in the colon. That's where it's all happening. So uh, the, the colon and the, the, the intestines are separated uh, by uh, by the the skin of the colon, which is the barrier between that and the and the uh, bloodstream. So everything that's supposed to be in the colon is supposed to stay in the colon. But what happens is when we start getting these uh, antigens, these these antibiotics, all these uh, toxins, they start uh, uh, causing holes in the uh, in the the what do you call it, the gut, and uh, they start leaking into the bloodstream and that freaks out the uh the immune system mm -hmm. and they start producing the antibodies and then you get uh, leads to chronic inflammation and uh because it's in it's it's the immune system produces antibodies that it starts you know with the chronic inflammation it starts attacking our own tissues and organs and then this can lead to autoimmune diseases so this is all a problem that these are problems that we need to deal with on a very personal basis. We have to take care of our, our own health. Absolutely. And you have so much wisdom and you've, you know, experienced so many things around health in your own life and you've seen incredible outcomes um, and you've kind of seen this transform, a lot of transformations and, you know, issues in our health and wellness um, industry. What are some solutions to the current health crisis? And what are some of your secrets to living a longer, healthier life? Because you are thriving and you're doing something right. Well, I think, uh, I think one of the things we really need is that we need, I don't know how even this is going to happen. We need doctors to start thinking about lifestyle practices. And, you know, I'll just give you an example. Uh, when uh, it was cigarette smoking, this was back in the 50s, everybody smoked. I mean, you looked on the screen, you you know, the all the, the movies, everybody smoked. All the, I, I smoked. Even the yeah, as a kid, I smoked. And airplanes, they smoked. <laughs> yeah, it was everything. It was cool to smoke. Yeah. So what happened is that in the the eventually the Surgeon General, there were so many studies being done. The, the Surgeon General eventually came out with the first warning against cigarette smoke, you know, linking cigarette smoking to, to cancer. And at that, it, when the smoking was okay in the 50s, that I remember, doctors even promoted smoking. I mean, there was advertised, doctors would advertise uh, cigarettes as it's good for you. What? It's good for your breath. It's good for your teeth. <laughs> they, it, you see some of these ads, they're unbelievable. But doctors were favoring it, and uh, actors and actresses were favoring it, so people smoked because everybody was smoking. But then when the Surgeon General came out with this, uh, eventually doctors came on our, on our side. And, uh, and that was really important when doctors, because they were smoking too, then they stopped smoking, and then they, you know, then it became a reality. Uh, <sighs> But the, the problem was the cigarette companies were so powerful that between the 1950s and when the Surgeon General came out with the, with the warning, there were already thousands of studies showing the connection between cigarette smoking and cancer. But we weren't allowed to see it 
because wow. of the power of the cigarette companies. So I think we need the help of the doctors to where, uh, you know, we, I don't know, maybe we just have to, how can we stop, you know, advertising drugs on, on the TV, you know? So we just got to realize, and that's why I think in today's day and age, I think it's going to be a more uh, uh, individual choice. It's going to be a grassroots movement yeah. on a grassroots roots level. I think people have to wake up. We can't wait for doctors. We can't wait for uh, the governments, you know, to tell our health authorities to tell us, you know, because they haven't, you know, they just not seem to be interested in it. So I think, you know, just by having this type of a podcast, more and more information coming out that people, you know, have to take the, make the decisions for yourself. At least we need to get the information because, you know, the information is out there, but we have to search for it because it's not really that mainstream. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it has to be, uh, uh, you know, it has to be uh, our own decision to say, I'm going to investigate, I'm going to check it out. And that's what I did. And that's what, you know, many people are doing. Yeah, and I appreciate you sharing that because I think it's so important to know history and speaking to someone like you who's, you know, you've lived through these sorts of things. The whole thing about smoking reminds me very much. It's very mirror image of what's going on right now with pharmaceuticals. Yeah. You know, it's kind of this money power thing that our healthcare system is for sale, unfortunately. It's, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, who's going to give the most money and, and have control over it. And it's, it's quite shocking when you see those kind of things. Right. Now, for those who want to learn more about your work, you, you know, what, what else you're doing? I know you do a lot of lectures um, and events and find out more about your book. How can we do so? Um, and do you have any other great resources you have around nutrition and health and wellness we can all check out? Okay. Well, I'd like to, uh, this is my book. Beautiful. It's, it it looks backward though, right? <laughs> no, actually, it looks correct. It looks correct. Here it shows backward. It's the Thriving right. Vegan. I wrote it in uh, 2019, and uh, it's got a lot of information, which is you know, some of it I talked about today. I'm working on my second book now. I hope I'm not sure if I'll finish it by the end of the year, but I want to do that. I also have an ebook that I'd like to uh, send out to anybody who would. Uh, would send me their uh, uh, send me an email Beautiful. requesting it. It's a forty six page ebook I finished uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, so I, I don't know if I should give you uh, my. You have my uh, website, right, the Michael? Yeah. Day. So if we post your website below, so everybody can have it. Um, if they click on that, there'll be some sort of pop up or a place where they can they can order the pop in their email to get the ebook. Yes, you could subscribe there. And also I have so much, I have videos on there and uh, I have over many, many articles, blogs I've written. So, uh, or if they write and send me an email to my, uh, I should give you my email too. Should I give it after? Uh... Um, I can post it below so we can do that. Are you on social media or not? Or is it a website? Yeah, email? well, it's, I have a Facebook page and oh, well. uh, I have a Facebook page, Go Whole Food Vegan which I have uh, 2,500 followers and, uh, and uh, I even have a Facebook, well, a vegan group here where I live in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. So, uh, so what I'll do is I'll send you my email. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. We'll um, post all that below. And also the, his book has so much information in it definitely go check it out you can you can get on amazon we'll post a link to that below and he also has some really great videos um if you want to learn more about these like paradigm shifts and you know the history of healthcare i highly recommend checking those out because it's so informative thank you thank you <laughs> um before we wrap up the show today do you have any final words for those who are struggling with a chronic illness or not finding solutions or for those who are just starting to navigate their health journey and looking to change their diet habits. Okay. Well, about, uh, I think if you, if you have a, a chronic disease, uh, unfortunately by the time uh, people reach their seventies, almost everybody has eat at least one chronic disease. So I think that it's really important to find out 
if you're chronic disease, it can be slow. Even if you're taking some, you know, pharmaceuticals, uh, even if it can be slowed down or even reversed, uh, for example, uh, heart disease can be reversed through, and there are books, there's information out there. I'm not a doctor, but I can uh, point somebody to, uh, where you can get the information, the resources, and uh, heart disease can be reversed. Type two diabetes can be reversed. Unfortunately, doctors, you know, they they because of the drugs, they say you can manage it. So that's what they do. They they help you manage a disease, but you don't have to just manage it. You can actually uh, slow it down, stop it, and even even reverse it. Uh, and that's what we need to learn. And uh, we can we need to learn how to live without disease, because, uh, you know, doctors and pharmaceutical companies are living from disease, the diseases we have, you know, that's where they make their living. We need to learn how to live without disease. And it's possible even in uh, extreme cases, for example, in this uh, uh, Caldwell Lesselstein in his book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, they used to give him, the, when he started uh, reversing heart disease through diet, the hospital, the, the Cleveland Clinic, was sending him rejects, people who couldn't even walk from one side of the room to the other because wow. of their heart problems. And he was he was reversing over 90 percent. He was having unbelievable success with that, you know, and it's getting your cholesterol down. It's just, you know, that's extreme, but we can do it, you know, if, if we have the right information and we at the right resources, you know, there is hope this way. Uh, so I can point people towards the information. If people, the other, if people send me an email, I have a whole list of resources, not on, uh, you know, books and, 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 uh, 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 documentaries and, uh, you know, recipes and, you know, so there's, there's a lot there and I could help out with that. All I need is, you know, somewhere to send it. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom um, in this day and age. It's so important, like you said, to get the right information. And there is hope, which is so exciting to turn these chronic illnesses around. And we really need to gain that knowledge for ourselves and take control of our own health. And thank you for sharing your journey right. and all this history that's so important to know and everything about, you know, plant-based diets and whole foods, um, you know, to help us mitigate and prevent chronic illness. And also thank you for the important work you're doing with your lectures and articles and doing these podcasts and your books to really help others improve their lives. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Christy. It was really wonderful. I enjoyed it tremendously. Remember, knowledge is power. The more you understand about your body, the better you're able to stay healthy and prevent disease. And a reminder, I am not your doctor, so please don't take this as medical advice. If you have specific questions about your health care, feel free to reach out to your practitioner. And if you like this video, please like and share with others. This information could really help someone you may know. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button to be sure you don't miss out on our future shows. And I will see you all next Wednesday on the next episode of Discovering True Health. Help.